Welcome back to John's Films. Today we're taking a look at the UI and understanding it in our Resolve for Beginners series. This is episode three. If you haven't seen the prior two, click above, jump into the playlist, and let's get going. When you first open Resolve, it opens up your project manager. Here's where you're able to create new projects, group projects, or attach to a different server, given that you've got the studio version of Resolve. What I'm going to do is jump in by creating a new project here. I've called it Resolve for Beginners 3. And when I load it, it takes me into the media page. Across the bottom are your primary navigational controls. Media page, cut page, edit page, fusion, color, fairlight, and delivery. Fusion is the 3D compositing space, and Fairlight is your audio mixer. What's great about Resolve is all of these tools are available within one program. That means you don't have to create output files, take them to another application to do, say, 3D compositing or sound work. Instead, stay right inside the workflow. And following the icons at the bottom, you're able to work through the workflow from the beginning where you pull footage in to where you output it for final consumption. You generally, in the media page, pull in all of the edit items that you like to use and organize your footage so that you can use it on either the cut page, which is meant for quick editing, or the edit page, which is more in depth, but gives you a few more options than the cut page. Next, you would take it to special effects in Fusion. Finally, you would color your footage, that is, apply both stylistic and color correction to the footage so that it gets the final look that you want. Then you can do your sound design here in Fairlight. This allows you to clean up audio as well as introduce new sound effects that you might use throughout your clips. And finally, on the Deliver page, this is where you're able to manage what output formats and styles you'll use as you generate the final video. Starting here on the media page, you can see we have our file browser in the top left. We have our media pool at the bottom. The general idea of this page is to be able to browse using your file browser here on the left where your footage is, pull individual clips of that footage into a media pool like so, and then be able to group them using a bin. The bin allows you to split footage into, in this case, these are screen captures. So I will place both of these clips inside the screen capture. Later, when I shoot introduction footage, I'll use that with actual video, and I could put that in a separate bin to make it easier to find on future pages. Once you have all the clips you'd like to use here in your media pool, you're able to jump over to either the cut page or the edit page, where both of those clips now you can see that I've put in my media pool are available, grouped by the bins for me to use. I'll start with the cut page. Here on the cut page, we have our media pool in the top left hand corner. On the right side of the top of the page, we have our preview window. This is where you can see both the source as well as, once we get a timeline going, the timeline. For this preview window, we have three major modes which are really helpful. So we have the source viewer, we have the timeline viewer, and then we have a really cool source tape viewer. This was like if you took all of the clips and you were to stream them together, you would end up with the source tape. So this is the first one. Here's the second clip. That white line denotes the break between the two of them. What's extremely handy about this is if you hit this button right here, which is the fast review option. This will now play back in double or triple speed, depending on how long your clip is. So if you watch the shorter clips, it plays just a little bit slower while still fast than it does the long clips because it realizes you're likely looking for something. And so in the short clips, it wants to make sure you see long enough to be able to find it. In the long clips, it wants to get you through it to the point that you realize where you are. Now, as I showed you before, to add items down into your timeline, you can click and drag down. You can press F9, which is the insert, or you can use some of these icons here which either append it to the end of the existing clip that you're working on, insert it, that would be this one here, or ripple. The ripple overwrite would slide and move items for you intelligently. 
Now, you may be asking yourself, what's this long blue bar in the middle? Well, let's see if you see. When I remove something from the timeline, that disappears. One of the major challenges in the edit page we'll see in a second is you do a lot of zooming in and zooming out on the edit. However, if I were to drop this down here again, you can see now I have the ability to slide through the entire timeline, even though it's longer than I can see here in the physical window, just by using this edit bar. And if I had multiple items stacked, I've now got stacked items here in my mini view. Didn't at first, but I've grown to really, really like this view because it allows me the ability to move quickly among all of the timeline elements. A couple other things to be aware of. Here on the left, you have the ability to add new tracks to your timeline as such, just added number three. You have the ability to add a marker, which you can also do with the hotkey M, any point in the timeline, there we go, or associated with a specific clip. The next page at the bottom in the workflow is the edit page. You'll notice it brought my timeline over from the cut page. Sometimes I use the cut page to construct the initial cuts and then pull it into edit mode where I'm a little bit more comfortable getting a lot of quick work done. Now, it's organized much like the cut page in that your media pool is in the top left with the same smart bins that you've had before. You have a source slash timeline viewer if you use single mode, whereas this icon up here on the right hand side gives you dual browsers. This on the left will always be your source. So anything you pull into it from the source pane here. While on the right, you've got a constant view of your timeline based on where your playback marker is. Each of these have their own play controls. And depending on which one is highlighted, you can see with the red naming there, and now it's red here because I've highlighted this left-hand source viewer versus the timeline viewer. If you hit the space bar, it will play back whichever one of those is currently highlighted. What's great about this, especially when you're constructing your footage, is in the source viewer, as I play it back, I have the option and opportunity to now press the I key, which is an in point. I have hit the L key a couple times to fast forward. Alternatively, I can hit the J key a few times to back up and then fast forward. I'm going 16X now. And that was the double space bar to stop it and then start playing again. And now I will press the O key, which gets an out point. I can now press F9 and boom, it inserts that individual clip I've made right there. Alternatively, I can drag down just the video or just the audio clip, as you see, from the source viewer. And that adds it to my timeline. And now, as I scroll through it, I can see it on the right because it's become a part of my project. Further, some more tools that you may already recognize. Here's again our snapping tool, which again is the N key. This is the linked selection, which means you'll notice both of these are highlighted when I click on either one of them. So if I click on the audio, the associated video matches, I can unlink those, so break that link, and now they're treated individually. This is helpful when you're trying to take the audio out or maybe perform a J or L cut so that you can introduce the audio from the next scene before you get to it visually. Here you've got basic edit modes. This is one of the more important ones. It is a blade. The hotkey for that is a B, and that's why we'll call it the blade. So you can hit it and then cut up footage into separate parts using it by using a mouse click after you turn it on. To get out of that, you would either click on this arrow here for select mode or Press A, and now you can move it around with the arrow. Out of this, the other things you need to know to navigate. This is the zoom in and zoom out wheel I was talking about when we were on the cut page. It can take a lot of work going back and forth, trying to place different items on the timeline, pulling them out, and then Alt and the mouse wheel will scroll in and out, so you end up doing that quite a bit. But this is one of the problems or annoyances that the cut page solves with that middle blue bar you saw, which represented our entire timeline. Here's where you can mute your volume by clicking on it, or obviously play a bit more. And on the right side, you've got a tri-panel. So you've got 
The mixer you can turn on down here in the bottom. This is just individual audio tracks or the main, which is all audio tracks. Further, you've got your metadata, which is what you see down here at the bottom. And this is data about the clip when it was shot. So now I know the audio was recorded at 48,000 hertz. I know that the footage was shot at 29.97 at 1080p. It's got H.264 encoding and AAC on the audio to channel. I can alter what data I can see here in this Dropbox, and it can give me a lot of data or a little data, depending on what was stored at the time of filming. Finally, we have our inspector, which is what you see here. This allows you to change properties about the clip that you've got highlighted. Here you'll notice I'm on a sound clip, and the sound clip gives me different attributes than the video clip does. The video has things like zoom, you'll see in my timeline viewer up there, position, so I can shift it around, rotation, woohoo! The anchor point, which changes where it sees the center of the rotation. So, for instance, if I do that, it's now rotating over a slightly different axis. And the pitch or the yaw, so tilt forward. Back, top, bottom, side, side. Further, you have other options like stabilization, a built-in zoom, cropping, read time and scaling, and lens correction. Finally, the fun stuff here on the left, we have our media pool as we discussed earlier, but we also have an effects library. This is access to all the Resolve, FX, and OpenFX that have been included with DaVinci Resolve, in this case, Studio. You're able to use these dissolve transitions, the iris transitions, etc. Here's some audio transitions, titles, pretty good group of titles here, which include many GPU accelerated options. To use these, you can just drag them onto your timeline, drop them on a clip, and you'll notice here it's got an FX here, and now I've got a zoom blur going on with my footage. The transitions you use by dropping near a cut or the start of a clip. You can see I've got a cross dissolve I've dropped over the middle, and you can edit the attributes for that by clicking on it and then using your inspector, as you might expect. Finally, at the top, you've got an index of your cuts, and you've got access to your sound library if you've set that up. This allows you to add a library here on your computer where you've got sounds so that you can search them and then use them within your clips. So you can see here, I've now got a library I've tied up to it, and I've got a whoosh sound that I'm adding as a sound effect. From our edit page, I'm going to put my playhead over the top of a particular clip, and I'll click on Fusion. This will bring into my input, Media In, that individual clip I had the playhead over. Here on the Fusion page, I have two viewers. I've got one on the right, which by default shows me the media out, though I can change that to whatever I want. And the one on the left, I'll click and drag my media in. So here you're gonna always see what's coming in, and over here you'll see what's going to go back out. I can change these on any node by using number keys as well to highlight. And you'll notice the little dot indicating that it's on source viewer one. So if I push one on the keyboard, it turns on or off the viewer nodes. Now, all the modifications that I'll make will come specifically across my note graph and operate on whatever gets fed to them. So here I'm going to take a simple effect of rays. I'll drop it down onto my graph. I will feed it the input, and I will pass it its output back to the media out. Now you can see the rays that are busting out of all the hot spots in the footage and you can adjust the attributes of those rays in none other than the inspector window. I can move them around. I can blend them or cause them to decay faster or slower. Change the weight of them to make them more, whew, or really take uh, the exposure up, which then attaches more of them to the screen and generally adapt them. So, that's not too foreign, right? We've got the inspector page. The node graph here is really the big idea because in our effects space, we've got 
a large amount of effects that we can use. And in some cases, as you've seen in some of my other videos, you can recreate studio-only effects in the free version of Resolve using these nodes. As you get more advanced and in other videos, I'll demonstrate how to use the particle subsystems, the 3D subsystems, and many other lighting and camera techniques. Now we move over to the color page. DaVinci Resolve historically was known for its color, and it was a coloring application. They've since built it into this huge suite of complete editing software. Because of this, the color page is spectacular. There are a lot of options, and you just have to be patient to learn which to use when. Again, you have a source viewer, comfortable with that. Again, you have an inspector type panel. This inspector panel, however, on this one is relative to a node. Now we've seen a node graph in Fusion. This one's a little different, but it still operates the same. You start with what's here as your input, and you generate something on the output, making modifications to it throughout the node graph. All the while, the clips that you have that you can work with, and these are your individual cuts from your edit page, are available to you here. In the clip bar, you can see this one and this one have stars because they've got fusion applied to them. This one has the zoom blur applied, and so it's got an FX to it. Once you color a particular clip, you get a colored box around the number of the clips, so you know it's been previously colored. The node graph here in the color page, you'll notice two primary inputs and outputs for each box as they feed each other. I'll hit Alt-S to add a serial corrector. The first green, the blue inputs here, are video masks. So if I create a mask here on this first node, you'll notice it's now represented here on the secondary node because I have copied the mask and carried it forward. So what are the types of things you can do here? Well, let's, uh, let's do something simple, something we do quite frequently. I'm going to build a vignette, and I'm going to try and make it pretty well. There we go. So I'm building a vignette, not necessarily useful on this footage, but you can see immediately here in the node, and now if I click this button up here, you can see which of the areas are affected by my mask, I'm going to invert that mask so that now I'm affecting the colored areas out here. And I'm going to pull down just a touch on my coloring. Do a little bit more so you can actually see it. There we go. And now the input to this node is the output of this node. So the input to our secondary node, all it knows of this footage is that it has a pretty heavy vignette on top of it. You continue in this manner, passing footage from one node to the next until you get to the end, and this becomes your final output and color for this clip that's highlighted in the clip pool. There's a couple other areas we should talk about. One, you've got your effects library over here on the right. So if I drop a dehaze on it, boom, I then get an inspector type page that allows me to modify the settings associated with the dehaze. Next, in the bottom left hand corner, You've got some panels. By default, you'll be looking at the primary wheels. This allows you to modify the color on the page with the offset wheel here. And this is for all color in all spaces. Now you may say to yourself, well, I only want the bright stuff to go towards a red color. Well, that's what the gain's for. The gain is the top end of your brightness or luminance schedule. The gamma is the midtone, so we'll turn those towards blue. So you can see the brightest stuff is now purple. The darker stuff is a darker blue-purple, and we'll go towards a green on the dark stuff. Now notice, you can blur out and cover everything if you aren't careful, so use these sparingly, but you'll notice now the dark spaces in here are green. No, you probably wouldn't actually color anything like that, but it's good to know how those function. Below you have some contrast controls to increase contrast, and your temperature controls and tint are on the second tab here. One of the best features that they've added in Resolve recently is this auto color or auto balance, which auto balances the colors, much like you might do if you were over here looking at your scopes, which are the colorful things in the bottom right hand corner. These scopes give you an understanding of what each light channel is doing here on our parade graph, R, G, B. 
if you're really trying to balance the white balance in an image, you would try and align these colors to have the same level of balance for white areas in your footage. Alternatively, you can come down to the bottom left, select the white balance dropper, and then pick something that should have a default white balance. There we go. And you'll notice it's pretty well dropped these down into a much closer view. On the left, you also have options for raw, for color checkers, for uh, the RGB mixer, which is a different coloring method. And if you've got the studio version, you'll see the ability to put motion effects like noise reduction and motion blur into your footage. In the middle, you've already seen me use the window, which creates a masked window. On the left side of these icon options, you've got your curves. If you're used to photo editing, these do the same thing, where the darks are on the left, the brights are on the right, and you can adjust the overall darkness and brightness increasing contrast, for instance, with an S-curve, like I've done here. You can also split these into their individual color channels by clicking the color channels above. The eyedropper allows you to get a qualification, that is to selectively select a specific area of your clip based on the hue, saturation, and luminance. You can use these individually, if you like, by turning off you also can click and drag to expand or close your selection. More on that in future videos. Again, you've seen the mask. Here's the tracker or the stabilizer. Here you can stabilize your footage or create tracks that track windows or special effects against your footage. Next, sharpening and blur. And finally, management of the node key that is highlighted up here in the node graph. This is especially helpful. I'm going to reset this. There we go. That was a right-click reset node grade. This is especially helpful when you're using your LUTs over here on the left. A LUT is a lookup table that remaps your colors that are in your footage to a specific theme that's generated in that lookup table. Let me see if I can find one that's a little more. Is there a correction? Here you go. I'll use false color to demonstrate. So I've dropped this LUT here on the footage and I think, oh, man, that looks great, but it's a little strong. Sarcasm. You can hit the key output down here in our node manager, node key, and pull it down to where it has less of an effect on the footage. Finally, there are a few other types of scopes. You've got your vector scope for saturation and color, your histogram to show you light levels inside each of the color channels, and you've got your waveform, which shows you uh, typical video monitoring output. I like to use the parade so I can get a balance across the colors and see if any particular color is clipping in either direction. Jumping to our Fairlight page. Here we have less of the visual and more of the audio, as you might expect. I've got my audio clips, and right now I have enabled the ability to see the video here in the timeline view options. The blue is the video, the green is the audio. I've got each of my audio tracks, and those tracks will carry with them audio, which I can play back by pressing the space bar and using the video viewer to listen on my headphones right now, specifically what the output is. I can monitor for overall volume levels here. I have individual channels and views here for each of the tracks so that I can tell specifically which track is hitting me too hot or too soft. There's a mixer available in the bottom corner so that I can adapt each of those individual tracks. And this is where audio mixing really comes in. I'm going to select a track, Audio 1 here, and you'll notice that it highlights it here in the mixer. This is where I have the ability to add effects to my audio. This is important because I can use it for noise reduction, which I do when I'm doing audio voiceovers here because of the fans that are running my computer clear near my microphone. I can also use it for uh, management of the vocal channel and other effects. Next, I would typically use the EQ so that I could clip out top and bottom sounds outside of my voice range. And then I would take out any unpleasant areas in my voice by managing each of these individual points, listening for the terrible sounds of audio. Finally, we have our dynamics. This allows us to put a gate 
to make sure we pull any really soft sounds out or if there's any loud sounds, I use a compressor to make sure they don't spike too hard and hurt headphones users. You have the ability to access your sound library here on this page as well. You may re remember we searched for a whoosh in my sound library earlier. There we go. If you need a sound library, follow the video you see up above to teach you where to get one and how to install it here in Resolve. I can use this in conjunction with the viewer pane above to insert sound effects into my video. Just like on the edit page, I have the ability to see the metadata and an inspector for the individual audio clip that I'm using. As always, the space bar stops and starts the playback. Finally, when we're happy with our timeline, we've got our audio mixed, we've got our coloring done, and any special effects added, I'm able to come to the Delivery tab. Here on the Delivery page, I'm able to specify what format of output I'd like to generate and to generate it out of a job queue. You've got your timeline at the bottom where you can select to either render based on in and out points that you can select with, these, with this gray bar or the entire timeline. I can choose a specific output setting. Here I have a preset which you can configure by clicking and adding a new preset. So I'll use my 4K H265 23976 frame rate output. I will choose an output selection area and I'll drop below to make sure that my settings are how I want them. Here you have the ability to select a format of your output. You have the ability to use a specific codec and if you have the studio version, you can use a hardware encoder or a native encoder, which is just the CPU, to render. Here you see my resolution that I'm outputting, the frame rate, and the quality. This is the bit rate that you will create your footage in. The higher you make this number, the bigger the file, but the more data it has to be able to recreate the video that you're creating. You can have variable bit rate or constant bit rate, and you can make many other changes down here below. Once you're done setting up your configuration, you click Add to Render Queue, and it will add it into the top right where you can now see I've got a job that I can run by clicking Start Render. If you're rendering for YouTube and you'd like to create a thumbnail, I'd suggest you come over to the color page, use the gallery, find a thumbnail out of your video that you want to use, right click, grab still, and then export this as a saved image. JPEG. Before you start to render. Boom. Now why would I say that? Ah, because now I can do other work. I've now hit the start button to start my render and I get a preview window of what's being rendered out as the timeline scrolls along and generates my output. I can right click on my job on the top right and I can get the file location that I decided to save it at open by right clicking and going to open file location so that I can view the output. Here it's getting built so I can't look at it yet, but you can see I use the scratch drive as an output area for most of my videos. Finally, you can use the home button in the bottom corner or the settings button to get to your project settings or to your project manager should you not want to use the menu options that are here for Projects Manager, Project Settings, or the key strokes. Once this gets done rendering, you'll have your output file, and you can click on File and Save Project to save this project to be able to come back to it in the future if you need to. Thank you for watching. This has been the third episode of DaVinci Resolve for Beginners. This will continue to be a series, so make sure you subscribe if you'd like to catch the future series, and if this video was valuable to you, please click the like button so others can start to find this video as well. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.